Welcome back to Bumblebee, guys. You already know why you clicked this video. Here we go, top 10 unusual surgery practices in history. Let's get medical. Number 10, plastic surgery. Some celebrities you think are immortal when really it's just their plastic surgery that's fooling you. Unless you're Paul Rudd, he's definitely immortal. Sometimes it's obvious who's had it done and sometimes it's really obvious who's gotten it done. Coming from the Greek term plastikos, which means to mold or to form, the oldest known plastic surgery took place in ancient Egyptian days. There's a medical text from the ancient Egyptian days that was named after the American Egyptologist who got it in 1862 and in it contains these ancient procedures. They look a little bit different from the shows we see today. You know, where it's like all these medical, we're gonna take this thing and put it into this guy's head. And you're like, how did they do that? This was a lot different. This is ancient procedures we're talking about. What procedure back then was to fix nasal injuries? This method used wooden splints, lint, swabs, and the first ever nose job was done. Even in 2000, a mummy was found with a prosthetic toe. So they asked volunteers to try walking with it to determine if it was created for purpose or for style. That's, that's nice. Here, try on this mummy's toe. Take a lap, see how you feel. Are you cursed? Plastic surgery in the sense of reconstruction, that first account comes from India in the sixth century. The Indian physician Sashruta Shamita is considered the father of plastic surgery. His patients were more interested in the cosmetic side effects, whereas the Egyptian practices were to fix the nose. Now around 500 BC, reconstructive surgery was done in India as well to reform noses that were cut off as a punishment. Number nine, broken bones. Sometimes a bone breaks and it needs immediate medical attention. Maybe a bone is pushing into a vital organ, maybe it's healing the wrong way, or maybe it's just a toe and you can't do anything about it but hobble around the house all day and learn new curse words as you mumble them and hobble. We all had that one friend in school who always had a cast on or that blue finger restraint. There's always the one kid. But what happens if you broke your arm in the 1300s? Then what? Well, you wouldn't get any cool signatures from your cool friends, but what would happen is that they would use these blocks of wood and cloth and just wrap everything around completely tight. Just the biggest cast possible. You actually could sign your name on this thing as many times as you wanted. I take that back. This thing was, you pretty much had a coffin around your leg, more or less. Number eight, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries, trepanation was the worst, that's for sure. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Turning the clocks back thousands of years, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory here is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's just drill holes into our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you would think. The reason that this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures. So you'd show up with a headache and then you'd leave with a hole in your head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is pretty surprising. They obviously didn't have advanced medical instruments. They would use any sharp instruments they could find, like rocks, flint, it was pretty rough. This was the first surgical procedure around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, which means means a borer to, you know, to drill essentially. Number seven, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extractions or whatever, but this for sure counts as surgery. Every time something gets removed from your body and there's blood, I'm gonna count that, sorry. I had to get a tooth pulled a few years ago and I'm still haunted by it. It is so barbaric the way they do it. They don't slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out. No, they had two dentists just grab my tooth at the same time, put their foot up and then just yank my tooth out. Not, like that was, the, we're still there, really? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem at all regarding your teeth. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later, tooth. Back in 5000 BC, a Sumerian paper referred to dental worms. So the earliest account of tooth decay, we think, unless, they were actual dental worms, in which case gross, but no, it was, you had a cavity. We're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology tell us now if the tooth's coming in sideways, but back then some believed it was always tooth worms, no matter what, if it hurts, it's worms, get them out. Imagine pulling your tooth out and being like, didn't find any worms. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry in 500 BC, and the way that they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw, so it was pretty horrible. If you go to the dentist now, just when you sit back and relax, you're sitting back and you're relaxing. That's it. The rest sucks, but these guys would stand up and just get the yanked. Number six, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go down. There was lots of bloodshed, of course. There's animals and warriors and a lot of stabby stabbies. And crowds would rush the arena after the day was done, not to get autographs, but to hopefully get a sweet sip of that gladiator blood. 
Yeah, blood was considered a magical elixir back then. And then near the early 1500s, blood was then seen as youth juice. Yeah, if you drink some young blood as an elderly, those knees would just magically come back. Apparently, don't drink blood if you're watching this. Don't, unless you're Edward Cullen, don't drink blood. Team Jacob. Lots of theories surrounding blood in the Middle Ages. Bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought that your humors were out of balance. It was like, oh, you're sick? You just got some weird blood. We'll, we'll just drain you out a bit. Vampires, all vampires. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey, and that just absolutely changed the game. Now the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture. Hypothetically. So we started to test this out on canines, of course. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between canines. So this is back in the 1660s. That's how early we started injecting things. Number five, mummification. Mummification was common. Even today we're finding more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history. But how the hell was mummification done back then? How was it done so well? We're talking about teeth worms and trepanation. How did ancient Egyptians figure this out? And how was it done? in a way where the bodies are still reserved this long. Well, it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that for free. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is basically, you get a hook in your nose and all your brains would be pulled out. And then they would cut the left side of your stomach, remove all those goods, all the organs, just bleh, gone, let those dry, yuck. And then you put the heart back in the body and then you wash the insides out with wine and spices over and over again until eventually you cover the body in salt for 70 days. And around day 40, you gotta stuff it with sand. Come day 70, that's when you can wrap them in those mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits you and so does the rest of your life. The jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber with the sarcophagus. So it was just a big room of yuck. Number four, cataract surgery. My brother was born with a cataract. This one's for you, homie. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. Found in a tomb in ancient Egypt was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. A little metal rod going into their eye. Just doing this makes me cringe. They believe this was a method called couching. This happened to be recorded. The needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time that it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. So they kind of were the OG couchers. It wasn't until 1747 until a doctor in France named Jacques Daviel, he performed the first cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. Every method, older, ancient, modern, it all sounds wildly uncomfortable. If you've been through this, kudos to you. Hit that like button, glad your eyes and stuff are working. Number three, transplantation. Blood transfusion is one thing, but how the hell do we figure out transplants? This arm, now over there on that guy? Hmm? The first successful one was in 1954 in Boston at the Peter Benton Brigham Hospital. That was like a surgical procedure. The first successful one, by any means, came from around 1000 BC. An Indian surgeon, Samhita, had written down details on how to transplant tissue from one of the body areas to repair nose injuries. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But later on in the 16th century, that idea was revised. In Renaissance Italy in the 16th century, a man named Gasparo Tagliacozzi, and finally, French surgeon Alexis Carroll changed the medical game again in 1902 they published their work on the new techniques using new studies on animals and blood vessels and to this day that technique is still used. In 1904 they partnered with Charles Guthrie in Chicago and performed the first successful animal transplant saving the dog's life. So not that long ago, weirdly enough, had to include it. Number two, open heart surgery. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean out the entire body and put the heart back in. Now of course they weren't alive during any of this, that body is long gone. But when was the first open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality? Well, the first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. Now the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way, used to be a shoemaker's assistant, saved this man. And the city's first interracial hospital too. Lots of firsts happening in this one. There we go. There weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all at this point. There were no x-rays, antibiotics, anesthesia, but also there was no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through the nerves, muscles, ribs, everything important, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, DC. Coming at number one, stitches. I'm gonna to totally jinx myself after this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. I'm on a high alert now at all times. 27, not too bad. Many of my friends though, they've gotten stitches in their life. It's pretty common at this point. So I figured I'd cap this list off by going back to the origins of stitches. 
Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, stitches were first made from plants, like hemp or cotton, or even animal tendons or animal arteries. Cat gut was the most common. That was a thread made of sheep intestines. One of the craziest ways of closing a wound was by using ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants or army ants, they would be held against the opening, and then you wait for it to bite down, and once it does so, you would then remove the body, cut the head off, so the head of the ant is still stuck biting onto your cut, staying there until it heals. Imagine Ant-Man showing up to save the day and he just throws a pocket full of army ants. He's like, I'm here, I'm here to save you all. He just shows up, whips all the ants. He's like, there you go, you're healed. They're like, we didn't expect this at all. Please send somebody else, Ant-Man. Gross. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into Bumblebee. I've been your host, Taylor McWatters, and we'll see you next time. Peace. This was a lot of research for this list. I like it, but I'm like, ooh, I'm stressed.